What's up, guys? It is February 19th, 2019. Uh, it's time for this week's Q&A. It was an open Q&A this week, so of course, all kinds of good questions. Um, we will jump right into it here on Facebook. <clears throat> First question, something I've always wondered, delicious foods, say shepherd's pie and chili. Clearly not prep food, but healthy do you consume this and how would you accurately weigh chili, for example, for required protein as it has diced tomatoes, kidney beans, add weight, etc.? Okay, so I can't say that I've ever eaten shepherd's pie. Uh, it's not really a popular thing. I, I mean, I know what it is. It's like basically like a pot pie um, type of dish. So no, I don't consume this or that. Uh, chili, yeah, uh, not often, but sometimes it's as far as like tracking something like that. You, I mean, you could still track everything that's in it. Um, it does get tricky because I mean, you could take the total macros of the entire batch and then obviously divide it up, but it's going to be a little inaccurate because you might have more beans in one and less beans in another, and more meat in one, less meat in another, or tomatoes or whatever. Um, Making a single serving of something is obviously going to be easier because you can just measure and, you know, track everything that's already in it, put it in, and, you know, you, and then there you go. But it does get, it does get a little trickier when you're making multiple batches. Um, the best you can really do is, you know, if, if your meals are the same all week and you make it for a whole week, then, you know, you could, you could track it that way because you could weigh the total batch and then, you know, even though the days might vary very slightly, um, you know, you're still going to be hitting those macros for the week. So it's not perfect, but I mean, you could certainly do it that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could, like I said, you could essentially just weigh everything that's in there. Uh, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with something like chili. Um, Okay, next one, another random one. <laughs> what is the dirtiest thought you've ever had? Oh my. Well, my house is pretty much constant political incorrectness and dirty jokes and inappropriate things, so it would be hard to peg one down. I pretty much live by, live by this kind of humor. Um, I don't know, but we definitely don't hold back around here. We are, uh, we like to offend people if possible. <laughs> um, that's why I enjoy British humor. Um, I was talking to somebody about this on the podcast the other day, Joe, considering, you know, you guys have a little bit different humor there. Um, I really like the dry British type humor um when we visited i really enjoyed it there i thought everything was pretty laid back and funny um not so uptight and everyone gets offended like they do here in the states uh next question your favorite breakfast when you have time to make it of course okay my favorite breakfast <clears throat> i fast most mornings so it's hard <laughs> As far, I, I mean, I like breakfast foods. Um, like if you're talking about just breakfast foods, I mean, pancakes, you know, I love pancakes. Um, that's probably my favorite. Like, I'm not into, I'm not crazy about, you know, anything fancy, really. I mean, give me some pancakes and I'm pretty happy. Hell, you give me pancakes and egg whites and I'd be pretty happy. Um, yeah, so, I, but I, I'm trying to think. Right now, I'm not doing a lot of breakfast foods in my in my diet. Uh, I have in the past, like I'll go through phases where I'll do that kind of stuff, and uh, but at the moment, nothing, nothing really breakfast related. But yeah, give me some pancakes, maybe waffles, uh, muffins, you know, stuff like that. I like all that stuff. It's good. And then I definitely use eggs and stuff in my diet pretty regularly. But I'm not like probably shock a lot of people everyone's so crazy about bacon i don't really care for it i mean it's okay but it's not like it's not certainly something i would ever 
make for myself other than like turkey bacon and stuff sometimes but I'm not I definitely am not crazy about bacon um, and we will move on sorry I don't have a good answer for you there <laughs> why do people say you can become diabetic by running exogenous insulin <sighs> is there any truth to this assuming that you have every unit you take is covered by carbs you need can you mess yourself up by running it for too long period of time and how does that work my thoughts are that if you abuse it and run too much like anything else you would mess yourself up all right so i hear this one a lot you will become diabetic from running insulin which is which is one of the more ridiculous things that you could say because insulin is a treatment for diabetes so no and the short answer is no you can't and the idea of insulin abuse is kind of also ridiculous if you think about it because you can really only take as much insulin as you know per a certain amount of glucose that you have in your blood if you take more you'll go hypoglycemic so if you're not you know however much carbohydrate you're eating you can only take a matching amount of insulin whatever that ratio is for you it's going to vary person to person um you know you can't can't really abuse it. Now, abuse might come into play when you have something like hyperinsulinemia where you actually have high insulin levels where, <clears throat> where you could indefinitely keep your blood glucose under control for the most part, just take more insulin. So it's really not an, a, it's really not an issue of abuse of insulin, it, more of an issue of abuse of eating too many carbohydrates that you don't really need and hadn't taking, you know, and then subsequently taking the insulin to match, if that makes sense. Uh, but if you eat, you know, amount of carbohydrates that's not excessive, um, that you that you need and that you're going to utilize and you're going to build muscle with or whatever, uh, you can't really take too much insulin. Again, you can only take as much as you need to bring your blood glucose down to normal. So, no, no, it won't cause diabetes, and it doesn't. It doesn't really work like something, for example, like ex exogenous testosterone where you take it and uh, it shuts down your hormonal axis. I mean, you're not going to produce your own. Your, you know, FSH and LH are shut down. You're not stimulating. You're not producing, you know, testosterone. But that's not the case with insulin because <clears throat> when you take it, it doesn't automatically shut down your, you know, your pancreas or your endogenous insulin production. If, if it did, then you'd have to take insulin at every meal. Like if it shut you down quickly, like for example, people will say, well, I just use insulin post-workout. All right. But they also have, or they use it pre-workout, uh, but they also have carbohydrates in other meals. Well, if it actually, you know, hurts your pancreas to the point where it was shutting down your endogenous insulin production, then those other meals that you didn't take the insulin, you wouldn't produce, you know, your pancreas wouldn't be able to produce insulin because it would be shut down. So that's obviously not the case. And people stop taking it and their pancreas is fine. It produces insulin to compensate. Um, so again, you can really only, like what you said in here, every unit you take is covered by carbs. Well, it would actually be vice versa. You take, you can, or, you know, you cover every carb with a unit of insulin or however you want to do it. But um, no, you're not going to cause diabetes. Uh, it would just, like I said, it would be more of a matter of excessive eating and you're constantly matching your blood glucose with excessive insulin because you're just eating too much. Uh, so most people don't get to that point. Like most people, I don't actually see hyperinsulinemia. I don't really, I can't say that I've ever actually had anyone that's that's gotten to that point, even using a lot of insulin because they, you know, their body was utilizing the carbohydrates. You know, I've actually had people that will check their fasted insulin levels um, and make sure that they're not, you know, that they're not excessive. So there you go. Yeah, that's a good topic. Uh, it's people say that and it's just puzzling because I'm like, well, I don't think you quite understand how insulin works and uh, how the pancreas works. So that would be my answer. Um, ooh, here's another doozy. So John, Chrysler, Chrysler, I'm not sure, I always get that mixed up, did a podcast on differing TRT patients from phlebotomies stating that there is a difference between polycythemia 
versus uh, oh, and uh, erythrocytosis. He feels frequent donations are actually more detrimental to health due to possibility of lowering ferritin via iron loss in the blood. What are your thoughts on this new research? And then he adds, he feels platelets are more of an indicator of potential for blood clotting via hormone replacement than uh, H&H, so uh, hematocrit and hemoglobin. And this, this is interesting because first thing you see when people say, well, I have high hematocrit, high hemoglobin, you know, my blood's thick. And what should I do? Most people say donate blood, right? Um, I've seen mixed. I don't, I don't have a perfect answer for this yet because I've seen mixed um, results in terms of people's lab, actual lab work. I have had people that do donate regularly that do get low... Um, low iron and it took me a while to kind of connect the two because there's such a high iron consumption in the diet with you know proteins and the meats and stuff uh but i you know what i'm not totally sure because i've seen people donate regularly and actually have higher hematocrit and hemoglobin and um some of the experts that i read on they you know they theorize or speculate that there's actually like a rebound effect you know you're gonna you're actually going to make the problem worse. You'll reproduce red blood cells quicker that way. If you donate, then you would, you know, normally. And I could definitely, you know, that seems pretty plausible, uh, makes sense. And yeah, I mean, in terms of clotting, yeah, platelet platelets are going to be more telling um, because they are a huge factor in, you know, blood clotting. Uh, but you don't, you know, you don't want your blood thick either. So there is link between blood thickness, stroke risk, things like that with H and H. So I don't have a perfect answer for that. I'm, I have, cause like I said, I've seen it kind of very person to person. Some will donate and, uh, their blood, their blood work will look better. It won't, they won't have that rebound effect, you know, between lab work. They won't have any issues with, uh, you know, the protein ferritin or iron levels or, um, platelets. Uh, and then others, yeah, they actually seen their, their blood markers get worse. They have low ferritin uh, and or low iron and um, actually end up with higher, more, you know, thicker blood from do donating regularly. So I don't know. Maybe it's just comes down to how quick does a person regenerate those red blood cells and, and uh, some are going to be different than others. That's kind of what I speculate, but I'm not, uh, I don't have a, perfect conclusion on that yet because like I said it kind of seems like it does vary person to person and I'm talking about someone that you know donates every eight weeks or right around that so that's what I've seen but that's a really good question and I think it's something that some people need to realize that they may actually be making the issue worse potentially all right uh, next one I think this is the last one yeah there was another one here on Facebook but it looks like Several people already had a conversation within the question and answered it. So I won't cover it because it looks like they did it pretty well. Um, next one's about low volume training. Have you ever experimented either briefly or long term with very low volume, high frequency approach? What were your experiences? Also, I know the term low volume can be subjective. <sighs> Yeah, definitely. I've done like, you know, your typical DC type training, which is just a purely low volume type of training. Now, here's the thing about low volume too, is we're talking low volume, like quote unquote working sets. But a lot of times when you're working up to, we'll give DC, for example, your top rest pause set. A lot of those acclimation type sets in there are still going to be sufficient intensity to stimulate hypertrophy. So, I mean, they are sets like they're you have to warm up. You can't just jump in and do a Widowmaker set of squats that's, you know, 20 reps or whatever without warming up. I mean, you're going to get working sets or volume within those warm up or acclimation sets. So the idea of that of low volume being one working set or whatever is kind of flawed. And I don't know, you know, it's just that you're you're taking that one working set to absolute mechanical failure or, you know, or whatever your program prescribes. Um, 
my only the only downside like I love this kind of training I personally love it I think it's great for progression in terms of strength um, progressive overload it could be good for somebody that doesn't have much time you know that's obviously could be a benefit uh, it can be great for just um, enjoyment people enjoy it because they can go in and beat their logbook it is progressive it does miss out on the volume component which we know is also important for hypertrophy but if you can enjoy something and be productive with the uh, increasing load, then, I mean, that's going to be effective as well. I mean, there's plenty of people out there that have been super successful using this type of training. So, um, for me personally, the biggest downside was it just completely obliterated my CNS. I found that within my training, I can do about two sets to full out, you know, balls to the wall, mechanical failure, um, lay on the floor, keel over and die type sets. If I'm trying to do any more than one or two of those in a workout, my workout just sucks. All of the other sets are not productive. They can't, you know, they don't really do anything for me. And even then my CNS just feels like junk. You know, even though I'm not doing a lot of volume, I just feel like shit. So I burn out quick on that type of training. I can, I found that I can do one to two of those sets within a workout, maybe and then do more of a moderate volume so I can get some volume in. It's certainly not high. Certainly wouldn't consider it high, but moderate. Um, and by volume, I mean all those sets that are sufficient intensity for hypertrophy. So I consider those the, the working sets. But that's my only down for me personally. That doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't work for somebody else because I've written low volume approaches where we use things like rest pauses or what, just one top set or... Um, you know, whatever. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it. It doesn't necessarily have to be DC, but yeah, it can work. Like I said, time constraints works really well for that. People that just really enjoy it and are progressive with it works good for that. It, again, it just matters, you know, like CNS resilience, like how much, how much can your CNS handle and you know, are you going to be able to recover? And, and, Typical DC was was like a lot of people were only doing like three days a week sometimes, even though some of them were doing, you know, maybe six where they did push pull legs, push pull legs or whatever. Uh, that's the higher, higher frequency. But it, the frequency thing is not really so much. The frequency does play into it because, you know, how long does your CNS have to recover between sessions if you're doing more actual days per week? But it's really the, you know, it's really the intensity uh, component that is, that can be troubling for some people. And it's, it's not going to hurt somebody that just doesn't generate that good of intensity, but somebody that doesn't generate good intensity is probably not going to get much out of it either. So uh, again, if you have a bulletproof CNS and you can just beat the shit out of yourself, then you could really enjoy this and do it. I wish I could do it more. I just can't, I just have to kind of pick and choose and get my, do my sets to failure here and there, which I do really enjoy, you know, so, yeah, that's kind of my, my thought on it. I think it certainly has its place. I definitely use it with people at times, for sure. So that's it this week, guys. I uh, appreciate all the questions, and I'll talk to you guys next week.